Welcome to RAL seminar. Uh, today it's my special pleasure to introduce Craig Clemens, professor at San Jose State University. Uh, Craig got his uh, Bachelor of Science in Geography from University of Nevada, Reno. He's a Master of Science in Meteorology from University of Utah and PhD in Geophysics from University of Houston. Um, he's uh, a professor at uh, Atmospheric Science Department and he also leads the San Jose State University Fire Weather Research Lab uh, that conducts research on wildland fire uh, weather. And rather than me talking, I'll let Craig talk about all the very interesting things that he does. So. Great. Thank you, Rongo. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, it's a real honor to be here. Um, and so what I want to talk about today is a number of uh, projects aimed at kind of understanding uh, wildfire environment in terms of fire atmosphere interactions. And so I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Neil LaRoe, who's at Nevada Reno, David Kingsmill here at uh, CU Boulder, and Nick McCarthy, who's uh, just finished his PhD at the University of Queensland. And I'll be showing some of their work. So, what I'm going to discuss today is uh, a little bit of motivation, why we want to kind of make these observations, uh, small scale field experiments, and how those are used to better understand the uh, fire atmosphere interactions at a micro scale. And then I'll talk about the RAD Fire Field Campaign and discuss uh, using mobile assets in the wildfire environment. And then uh, lead into uh, some observations from our new mobile KA band, uh, dual pole Doppler radar. And with that, we had four deployments this year. One was a, the FASMI project, which is a preliminary project called the uh, Fire and Smoke Modeling uh, Evaluation Experiment. And we were, had the opportunity to uh, go to a prescribed crown fire in Utah to test the radar. And then some future work in summary. OK, so motivation. So rapid response deployments for studying wildfires. Uh, wildfires uh, have been neglected. I think in the terms of in, in the meteorological framework, uh, there's few coordinated field experiments. Uh, new observations that we've collected over the last uh, 15 years and more recently the last five years on active wildfires have shed a light on the plume dynamics and the structure of the plumes. And so these data sets have provided uh, model evaluation data. So for these new generation coupled fire atmosphere modeling systems and smoke transport models. A lot of this uh, these models have never been able to have the correct data sets for validation. And so one thing that I keep highlighting in this talk is that everybody has to be fire line qualified. So I'll go through that a little bit more, but all my team members are uh, Firefighter 2 qualified. We're listed as a national resource in Ross, red carded, and so we get access to uh, these incidents. You just can't show up on a wildfire with a radar and get be in between the firefighters in the front. So, so just for some uh, background, the fire environment, I always like to use the fire behavior triangle. So basically, weather, fuels, and topography. And this is what's really driving your fire. So you know, as a meteorologist, I'm always focused on the weather. But it's the fuels that really can drive a lot of the fire spread mechanisms that uh, we have you know, poor understanding of. And obviously, topography-driven fire spread in canyons. And I'll talk a little about a future project that we're doing in a steep canyon in Spain. So obviously, the weather is the most variable. And that's really where our focus is on a lot of, of our studies. So to give you some, fr some framework, uh, thinking about the Car Fire tornado, many people probably heard about this. The EF3 that uh, formed on the Car Fire, uh, that was in 2018. We took these photos. We got to go visit the site. Uh, we were invited by the Forest Service. And so here's a gas line that's actually wrapped around a tree. I mean, a complete devastation. And so this uh, pyrocumulonimbus went to 40,000 feet and stretched this column up. And so there's a paper by Neil LaRoe and colleagues that uh, did analysis of that event. So it turns out that we still don't have a great understanding of the dynamics of how wildfires create their own weather and what role this has on fire behavior. And so that's kind of what we're looking for. And that's kind of the focus of our research program. And with that, uh, if we can go back to uh, 1954 with George Byram's convective fluid number, 
where he basically looked at the power of the wind versus the power of the fire. And so this framework allows us to kind of determine whether or not the, plume, the fire is plume driven. So if it's really more heat driven and weak winds, the column's gonna stand straight up in, in theory. Right? If it's a wind-driven fire where the heat of the fire is less intense, this doesn't always work, and it's highly wind-driven, plume's gonna tilt over, okay? And so we've kinda described those in the literature as plume-dominated fire spread or fire environment versus a wind-driven fire. And then looking at uh, coupled atmosphere models, this is a simulation of a field experiment, the Fireflex experiment, using uh, my colleagues in France. This is the uh, Meso NH and the Four Fire, so it's very similar to Warf Fire that's being uh, developed here at NCAR. And so you can see that this is a very high resolution, I think they're uh, 10 meters. And so you see a simulated fire front, you have uh, smoke being generated, ah, the, the graphics aren't very good, but those are velo flow field velocity vectors. And so to, ca to calibrate or to validate what this model's doing, we actually need sensors in the environment here. We need towers, we need to be able to sample that so we can actually measure what's happening at the fire front as a what we call fire front passage, as the fire moves through the instrumentation array. So that's where the small scale field experiments come in. And so we went back in 2013 to our site in uh, Texas, where we did the original Fireflux 1 experiment that the simulation is of. And we conducted a uh, study in the same field. There's a 42 meter tower. I'm not gonna go through a lot of the details of the experimental design, but the idea, and this is under red flag warning, the state of Texas was under a fire ban. And so there was some negotiation before fire was put on the ground to get this experiment off. We had a helicopter in the air and so it was coming and this is like they, they canceled the burn and we got it. All. The Texas Forest Service helped us negotiate this ignition. And so this is a basically a 500 meter by one kilometer tall grass prairie. It's fairly natural. Um, it's mostly uh, native grasses, uh, little blue stem, tall, big blue stem. And so there's a, a hand ignition crew. So it ignites here and they spread out. Um, the ambient winds were about eight meters per second. Ambient uh, humidity was 24%. So that was red flag warning in Houston. Okay, and so what you're seeing over here, you know, let me just, before I explain the, the, the figure, let me click this. So you can see the fire front moving through the tower. So we have some cameras in, the, in here measuring heat fluxes and um, monitoring the fire spread. And then we have sonic anemometers and thermocouples on the main tower here. And, we're, and a GoPro camera that actually turned on right on time. So. We're able to see how the fire spreads through this environment under this, these types of conditions. But with all these sensors, I'm gonna walk over here and kind of point out what you're seeing here. So this is a composite of the perimeter anemometers, which are cup anemometers, the interior uh, turbulence towers. This is the 42 meter tower with three levels of instruments, of sonics, and then two, three six meter towers. Then we had the LIDAR place, and the LIDAR is a laser-based radar kind of thing that shines a laser across and we can measure the uh, backscatter intensity off the particles and we can measure the velocity field. And so what I've plotted here is the velocity field. And so what you see is the reds are higher winds that are away from the LIDAR and blues are towards. And this is a very windy environment. And what you do see is you see these vectors changing. So we're getting fire-induced winds as the fire front moves through the plot. And these black dots are temperature sensors at the soil surface, so we know where the fire front actually moved through. We also had airborne infrared and tower-based IR cameras as well. We also had an array of pressure sensors, so we're able to look at the surface pressure evolve as the fire front developed and, and moved through the, through the course of the, the burn. So as, well, here's now the fire's right about here, so the bigger the dot, the hotter the temperature. There's a pressure drop with this field here, so we can see these lower pressures, about a half a millibar. And then you can see the more red uh, uh, shading is the LIDAR, and that's showing that the fires are, the fire-induced wind is accelerating at the fire front. And another way to look at that, and we've seen this in other grass fire experiments, is that if we plot, uh, this is a time height plot, so this is time of ignition, so time's this way. 
These are the thermocouple temperature contours. So the highest temperature is near the surface as expected. That's about 350 degrees C. So it's actually not the ignition temperature. It's just uh, gas parcels hitting the tower. And then these are the uh, wind vectors. And so you see a slight shift in the wind direction at the surface, but everything else is fairly constant because it's such a strong wind-driven environment. Here's the pressure drop here. This is what we call FFP or fire front passage. And so we can actually see that the hottest temperatures remain near the surface, and that's advecting these gases to the fuels. And so the advection of the combustion gas is ahead of the fire front due to this pressure field that's generated with the plume is what's causing the ignition of gas of the, of the fuels ahead of it. And so in another case, we have a project in New Zealand. We did a similar study with a group of the US Forest Service and Scion down in New Zealand burning these small paddocks of uh, stubble. And here's a video looking at this fire. It's very similar to the fire flux, just a slightly different fuel type. And you can see these flame towers and troughs. And if you see this diagram, this conceptual model from Mark Finney et al, uh, showing what they've seen in the lab, where you have air rushing through the fire front, pushing the flame front down, and some regions where the flame front then also stands up vertically due to this tower and peak and trough structure. And if we look at the infrared of this fire, the hottest gases of the reds, and you can see that they're being evicted close to the surface. And so the ignition gases are being pushed to the fuels through the fire front. And so this is similar to what we saw in the Fireflux 2 experiment, but we're seeing it a little bit more detail on these smaller scale burns. So we kind of understand what happens at the micro scale around fire fronts. And this is fairly new. We've only been making these types of observations for the last 10 years, 15 years. But what happens when we think about large wildfires? Does this scale appropriately? I mean, you know, we got we're talking 10 foot to maybe 30 foot flames here, or flame heights. Thinking about chaparral and forest fires, you're talking 100 foot flames and greater, so much bigger heat release. And so that brought us to the RAD fire uh, program, the Rapid Deployments to Wildfires Experiment. Basically, we have a LIDAR mounted on a truck with a radius on system, and we chase wildfires, and we did this for about six years. And so it was summarized in a BAMS article, we had about 30, wildfire sample to date. Uh, we deployed the Doppler LiDAR very close to the fire front. And this is the kind of example of what we see with the LiDAR where you know, we're out two kilometers, we can see the plume punching through a uh, stable layer. This is in coastal California. The plume goes up through the stable layer, and then it detrains down, but it doesn't come back down to the surface. It detrains out on that stable layer. So we can see lots of different structures. One thing about these, uh, this field campaign is that uh, we want to get as close as possible in a safe manner. Everybody's red carded. We're sponsored through the Tahoe National Forest because a red card is a, is a federal firefighter card. We're available through Ross. So to date, I think we're the only meteorological team in Ross uh, available to be. That means that we can be requested to an incident with our facilities. And so what we do on a fire is that we provide the incident meteorologists and the fire behavior analyst data. So we can do that through social media. A lot of times we have to tweet it out or we text it because a lot of times we just don't have, they, it's hard to do phone calls between uh, incident command team and, and the team and the field. So we provide vertical wind profiles, plume height, these types of observations. And you know, the, here are the students scraping around the radar truck. This is during the Kincaid fire. It was blowing 50 miles an hour at the surface, uh, gusting to 75 to 100 on the ridge tops. You can see where the fire is burning. And so, of course, you know, I'm standing there watch, filming this while we're making observations. But we, didn't, we only had one, one shovel. And you can see that, oh, we should have brought another one. But um, anyways, so it turns out that wasn't really a dangerous situation. It turns out that fallen trees and a big wind event is what we really had to worry about. And so now we have to get trained in chainsaw because we needed one. And uh, we came up on, on the, in the Kincaid, we came up with the sheriffs and helped them pull some trees out of the road. So it's quite a, a unique environment in terms of trying to make observations. So this is uh, a paper from Leroux. And Neil Leroux led this paper uh, of the um, El Portal fire. So this was probably the most classic paper plume that we studied. We were within like three kilometers of this perfect idealized upright plume with a crosswind. So here's the LIDAR. Here's some students taking photos. 
And you can see that the LIDAR gets really highly resolved observations of the plume. And so we've sampled lots of fires with this, with the Doppler LIDAR. The panel here is the mean backscatter, which is the contour, and the mean velocity field. So you can see indrafts. And what's surprising, with this small plume, we're seeing indrafts out one and a half kilometers away from the base of the plume from both sides. So blues are towards, reds are away from the LIDAR, LIDARs are here at zero. And so these are RHI scans. And then what Neil did is he calculated the variance in the backscatter intensity. And this is the plume center line, the blue line. And you can see that the strongest variance is along the lower edges of the base of the column. So that's where we're getting most of our turbulence along that edge. And um, so pretty exciting, um, pretty exciting observations. And it's always nice to have a, a, the perfect wildfire plume in, in a perfect condition with a perfect line of sight, which never happens. Um, we deployed to the campfire on the first day that it ignited. Uh, we, got, we heard that it, it, there was a fire on this day, and we, were, we basically knew that November uh, 8th, there was going to be a fire in Northern California because it's November, we were in a drought, there's no rain, and we had a, a big wind event. So something was going to happen. You just don't know where it's going to be, but you kind of prepare that there's probably something happening this next day. And so we didn't get up there. We didn't realize what it was. We heard there was a fire in this area, so we drove out. And as we were driving, we could see the plume you know, spreading across Sacramento Valley. And so we deployed on the south flank of the fire by the time the fire was kind of burning in this area. So it burned really quickly in the first few hours through, through the town of Paradise. And so we set up here. This is my student. Um, and we were doing vertical wind profiles on this flank. And the reason we're doing that is we don't know what the vertical wind profile is on these fires. It's a downslope windstorm. We don't know what the lo level jets look like. And so with that, we can also drive in a mobile fashion with the LIDAR and cross through the plume and under the plume. And this is a stationary, uh, a stationary uh, plot where we were fixed at one location at the south flank. And you can see this is the backscatter intensity, and these are the wind vectors from the vertical profiles of the wind from the LIDAR. And so you can see the plume is very shallow because it's wind-driven. It's just tilted over, and all the smoke is within the lowest 1,500 meters to 1,000 meters. But one thing is, the LIDAR profile, this is the mean average profile for the, for the first period, and this is the second period that we, we, second site. And we compared it with the simulation that Matt conducted with WARF. You see that WARF really overestimates. It gives you kind of a more classic low-level jet in the lower layers here when the mean for that grid area is, is slightly more constant with height. This one has more of a, a, a um, nose to it in terms of the wind profile. Matches a little more closely. Obviously, you know, you can't get it perfect. The direction was pretty good here. So these wind profiles provide the model simulation, some data for basically um, you know, setting up the model and testing it. So we use that. Here's the, where, we, when we left, the fire was finally approaching the road. And so the LIDAR is actually scanning mobile. But you'll see the flame heights here, about 80 feet, burning through uh, gray pine. And, and now it's, you see the ember cast here. So this is one thing that's neglected in a lot of fire models. And with our discussion today, hearing that the wharf fire is, has a more uh, sophisticated uh, ember and spot fire uh, algorithm in it is really exciting because that these flames aren't going to cross this road, but those embers have already started fires. So we would pull over, make more measurements, and pretty soon you'd see a fire burning on the other side, even though the flame front was far away. And now the fire fighting community, they know this. But the scientific community really have to capture this type of uh, context in terms of looking at how fires are spreading. It's not just flame contact. It's really ember generation, and in the campfire particularly why it spread so fast so quickly, or so far so quickly. OK. And that was probably one of the closer deployments to the fire line that we've made. The issue is, is when you're making an observation, you're, you're there as science. We want to stay out of the way of first responders. We do not want to get in the way of any fire suppression activities. So we're usually not that close. Um, so we try to maintain distance. And so we have a good relationship with CAL FIRE, and they know, that, you know who we are. So we also had an opportunity to fly the Wyoming King Air on a pyro cumulonimbus. 
And this was the Pioneer Fire. And this is work that's been led with uh, David Kingsmill and a student of mine, uh, Bruno Rodriguez, who's now at the Weather Service in San Diego. But uh, we requested some test hours to just get the aircraft on a fire to see if the radar worked. And so this is a picture I think that Dave might have taken uh, as they were flying through the Pioneer Fire. And so they penetrated this plume. And um, what was unique is they, we wanted to test the Wyoming cloud radar, a W-band radar. And so this is the flight height, the flight level. And I don't, sorry, I don't have the scale off here. It's about seven kilometers. Um, and here's the vertical velocity field when it went over. And this dot here is the maximum velocity of 56 meters per second. Sorry, 58, 58 meters per second. And when they first penetrated this, they penetrated about 15,000 feet. So that would be about 10,000 above sea level. I think it was like five kilometers, I can't remember. Um, anyways, they went through it and measured in situ 37 meters per second updraft. And then they went back up higher and kind of went through the tops of it. And so one thing that they were able to capture is some of the pyrometeor concentration. So this is scales 1.3 millimeters, so very coarse. What? That's these connectors. Oh, no. This happens in my classroom with this new USB-C HDMI thing. Come on. It does. It'll come back. There we go. All right, so you can see all sorts of uh, shapes with the pyrometeors, which we don't have a good handle on. And so uh, what I'll show you with the KABN radar, some interesting things with, with some of the uh, dual pole properties of that. So this is the first time we've actually really been able to observe these types of uh, aspects and looking at some of the microphysics of pyro CU and pyro CB. I don't think we'd, they'd ever fly through this again, but... Uh, <clears throat> Just seeing this structure, I mean, that's pretty incredible to look at the structures that we see in these plumes. OK, so with that, uh, thinking about radar reflectivity associated with ash and debris, uh, Nick McCarthy uh, has this figure in his paper talking about all the different processes that you can have going on in terms of what pyrometeors, you know, condensation on the pyrometeors changing size distribution with this distance from the source, sorting of heavier debris downwind. You know, how big do the particles have to be to get lofted, or do they drop out at lower altitudes? Um, all sorts of different aspects. Entrainment of soil, that's been found to be a high concentration of some of the um, particles, is the entrainment of soil from the fire-induced winds at the surface that get lofted in the plume. Uh, Nick has this picture of some uh, some fire brands, well, some uh, ash here with raindrops, OK? So that's an ember, these embers. And then this fell out in front of our radar about a kilometer from the fire front. This is a three-inch three leaf that's smoldering, so it's got some glowing combustion. So that potentially could ignite. But that, these are the kind of things that we're seeing falling out of smoke plumes, in addition to ash, right? So crazy sizes, all sorts of different sizes. Uh, this is uh, a picture from Nick McCarthy's PhD work where he took this Furuno X-band, the little polarized mobile X-band, which is really a great instrument. And they set it up on a number of fires in Australia. And here is their horizontal reflectivity. And what you see here is this, this one fire, the Mount Bolton fire, there was a thunderstorm. And you see the rain downstream of the plume. The ZDR has a different signature than the rain and the um, correlation coefficient as well. So they're getting correlation coefficients in 0 0.2, 0 0.3, up to 0.5. <clears throat> Ours are slightly different with the KA band that we've seen. So they were able to really show the differences in uh, ash or uh, plume debris in terms of the correlation coefficient. And so with all those uh, data sets from the, the Wyoming King Air and the work from McCarthy et al. We approached NSF with an MRI grant and were able to uh, secure funding to purchase a, a KA band scanning polarimetric uh, radar. And so we mounted it on a flatbed truck. We had uh, automatic leveling jacks installed on it. 
uh, that the students and I put in. This is hydraulic jacks, and it's really pretty quick. You can get the instrument, the radar leveled in three minutes with one button. And you can retract it in about the same amount of time. And the retraction is really important. If you're set up on a fire, it's like, is the front jack up? <laughs> so um, yeah, so very rapid response. And the way the software works is a pro sensing uh, radar. Uh, it's wavelengths 8.4 millimeter. Um, so dish is 1.8 meters. Uh, it does uh, alternate horizontal and vertical polarization transmission, simultaneous receive. The beam width is 0.31 degrees. And so it has uh, the scanning capability, so it's 20 degrees per second at max. So we usually scan about 10 degrees per second. So that's, you know, we can do an RHI 10 degrees per second, much faster than our LIDAR. And so our first deployment was to the uh, Briceberg fire near Yosemite. So Yosemite National Park's right on here. And this is out here in the foothills. And so we were pretty far away. And so the, the data are really coarse. This is the uh, back uh, reflectivity. What you do see is you can see these reflectivity cores or pyrometeor cores that are punching all the way through the top of the plume and kind of being invected out the back side. If you kind of watch this. Now it's really coarse, but you can see these things penetrating real quickly. And that's because of that quick scanning capability. With the LIDAR, we weren't able to catch this structure before. And so even at large ranges, greater than 10 kilometers, we can get high, obs uh, high resolution observations of the plume structures. Um, so the RHI scans show these large pyrometeors or more pyrometeors uh, propagating vertically through the entire depth of the plume, which is pretty exciting to see that kind of structure. We deployed to the Kincaid fire, which was the largest fire in California last year. Last year was a nice quiet season for once. And so, um, of course, you always have to have, there's always a fire. And so it ignited on the 23rd. It was the largest wildfire at 77,000 acres total. PG&E had their largest public power shutoff in history, or the largest public power shutoff in history of 2.8 million uh, people. And uh, it threatened about 90,000 structures. And that fire, actually, the evacuation was already to the coast because they're expecting a real strong downslope windstorm event, Diablo wind event. And so we deployed on the first night here. This is in Alexander Valley Vineyards. So this is Alexander Valley um, near Healdsburg. And so the fire was actually burning on this ridge line here. And then on the second night that we went was the 26th, and that was the big um, PSPS where they had um, much stronger winds forecasted. This was a moderate downslope wind. This was a much stronger wind. And so we only took the radar on this, this night, and we brought the radar and the LIDAR truck to this, this deployment. So we went to the same fire twice. And on this second night, which I'll show you some observations, the fire kind of burned this way, and eventually burned all the way down to Windsor. And then we deployed down here in Windsor as well as it was burning through um, near, near the suburbs. So the first night, these are the RHI scans. So we got radio velocity on the right, reflectivity on the left here. Plume is very shallow, right? Because it's wind-driven plume. It's just blowing over us. And this is where we were seeing the ash fall and the debris falling out. Then you get these energetic pulses with higher uh, dBZ. And you can kind of track this stuff kind of falling down. And so. Large ash and large firebrands were observed falling out from, from the plume at the deployment site. And we saw spotting. We saw lots of really unique structures. Uh, with this resolution of the radar, we, we had it set at, it's, you can have it set at 7.5 meter range gate, but we get the best sensitivity at 15 meter range gate. But look at this. You're seeing this lee side eddy here, where you're getting the upslope and then the downslope with the ambient wind here. So that was kind of unique to see that at the surface. The second night, which was the 26th, the 27th, we deployed and uh, we were basically, the fire was burning kind of perpendicular to our location, eventually burned down towards us. But we were making PPI scans. So these are horizontal scans, very rapid horizontal scans. And what you can see is the highest DBZ here, these highest reflectivities, are where the active fire front is. And this is the smoke being invected downwind. So you can see some active burning here popping up. Smoke is 
continuing. Uh, I don't have the figure here, but the highest spectrum width is also associated with these high dBZ cores. And the spectrum width is kind of a, a way of looking at turbulence in the volumetric, uh, in the volume of the, the pulse volume. And so with that, that high spectrum width is associated with the highest turbulence because we're in a sheared environment. We're getting the plume punching up. And so you always see the, the high spectrum width kind of advecting along with these uh, high reflectivity cores. So with that said, that allows us to maybe estimate where the fire front is and where it's propagating. So we can get maybe higher resolution fire front measurements as it's moving through the environment. All right. OK, so that's all really cool. We've been able to really see the sensitivity of the KABN radar and you know, get it on a couple of wildfires. But we had opportunity to go to uh, the FASME project. And we were actually planning another site in the Fish Lake National Forest with a much more elaborate experiment. But because of snow, it was kind of canceled. But they were going to do this burn anyways. And so I said, let's go. Let's just drive out there. And so Neil showed up with his LIDAR. We had our LIDAR, and we had the radar. And so here's the plume that we sampled. And uh, it's, it was quite impressive. Um, here's the first. So we're doing RHI scans. Is that going to come back on? Is that normal? Or is that me? It could be the it could be this. I have bad luck with computers. It usually like there we go. All right, dude. Are they, big movie files? they are big movie files, but this has been running. Okay, so here's the reflectivity. You can really see these great details in the plume. We've never seen this before. Um, real strong. You see these structures just propagating all the way up. Real fine detail, the velocity structures as well. And you can see kind of rolling over with um, uh, ring vortices forming on the edge of the plume. There is some ambient smoke in here that's actually picking it up. So they did some fires on the other side of the hill behind us, behind the photo. And so there was a level at the, the stable layer where there was some residual smoke. The differential reflectivity, we're not, we see a little bit of a difference, but we're not at the lower altitudes in the plume, but we don't see a big difference in either that and the correlation coefficient, which suggests, and well, let me look at the next, let's look at the next plot because that's, because we know that there's a cloud forming on this. Okay, so this is what we were scanning. Okay, this plume went to, see, we're at 3,000 meters above uh, sea level, so, and we're six kilometers above that, above ground, so we're pretty high, at about nine kilometers above sea level. And with the reflect, with the correlation coefficient, we're not seeing a big change, which suggests that inside this pyrocumulus is a lot of the same ash that's down here. And so, because the radar is, has a hard time with very small droplets, it can't detect the small droplets, but it can detect the ash. So we're able to see that that ash is probably penetrating all the way through that cloud, and that you just what you're seeing is you're seeing the water droplets, the cloud droplets here, but not the ash, obviously. But with the um, dual pole and the correlation coefficient, we're seeing the ash. Now, what we're going to do is we're doing some averaging here, and we're getting some slices through here so we can get like a, a long beam average of the, uh, both the differential reflectivity and the correlation coefficient. But just to see these real uh, detailed structures of this plume with the velocity field is quite unique. And so these prescribed fires allow us to do that because we're in a safe environment. It's, you know, we set up, we have time to, to determine where we want to put the radar, where they're going to burn. And so we have, it's more of an experimental design versus can we see the plume? Can we park here? Is this safe? And how long can we be here, right? So it's a decision. It's, those decisions don't have to be made with an with a experiment like this. OK, so what about the heat flux? We also want to, this is an active crown fire, so it's burning really intensely. We're three kilometers from the actual fire. So we were also able to test our new uh, Telops mid-infrared uh, fast camera. So it's three to five micron. It's um, semi-high resolution. It's not as high as the newer cameras. But um, it's cooled, and it's calibrated. Oops. It's cooled and calibrated to 1500C. And so you can actually see the hot gases. This is from three kilometers away. You can see a lot of the structures in the plume. 
Okay, so that's really, and these temperatures, I recalibrated it, it's closer to about 1400 C, these hottest temperatures. So uh, this, this was a previous calibration. So with this, this, ca this camera could be mounted in an aircraft as well, but it's also ideal for like understanding what's happening at the ground level. So we know what the heat flux is going into the base of the plume. And the fact that we were able to get that kind of detail. Okay, so future work. So this is where we are right now. We're, we're making these observations on active wildfires and on experimental fires, and we're trying to better understand the plume dynamics and, and kind of fire spread in general. But we, this is all mostly flat terrain. Most of our experiments are in flat terrain. And we really are, and I'm really interested in fire behavior in canyons. And so it turns out that f the most eruptive fire behavior occurs in canyons. And so uh, Dominguez Vegas proposed uh, the term fire eruption. It's also known as blow up fire, when fires uh, accelerate, their spread rate accelerates all the way up the slope as it spreads. And firefighters know this. Um, so fire eruption in canyons is not rare, but it's something that needs to be better understood. And it turns out that most firefighter fatalities, a lot of firefighter fatalities occur in canyons, so all around the world. Portugal, Spain, the US, France, and so this is an area of research that's fairly active in, in both laboratory and numerical simulations. So uh, Dominguez Viegas has a lab in, um, outside of Coimbra, Portugal, where he does a lot of these experiments using idealized canyon geometry and looking at different uh, slope angles, different uh, actual uh, shapes of the canyons. And what you see is when you get an ignition, you get this the fire is going up the fuels, and I'll explain that a little bit in the next slide, but then it explodes up the sidewalls. And so this is the simulated uh, fire spread growth. So it's fairly constant, all of a sudden it just explodes in terms of area burned versus time. And that's because of that explosion up the sidewalls. And this is likely due, it's been proposed that it must be, since the slope limits entrainment into one side of the fire, you have fire-induced flow from the back side. In addition to the fact that the flames are tilted, because the slope's tilted, the fuels are closer to the fire front. So you're getting more radiation and more uh, flame contact and convection. But this fire-induced flow is actually helping to accelerate that. And it turns out that the 24 to 26 degree is like the flame attachment angle. And so we're hoping to do uh, experiments at different angles. I've done some experiments in California at like 20 degrees, and we didn't have flame attachment. And so this is what we're really looking at trying to do. So we have a site in the Pyrenees that is a one kilometer, 1.3 kilometer long canyon. It's got complex fuels. This is, the, this is France, this is Spain. So it's politically complicated, but um, because if it burns up here, it's likely going to spot over an international border, and so we're trying to plan the um, kind of logistics with that. So we're currently talking about doing this either next winter or the following winter, depending on if we can get everybody on board. So a lot of international uh, agencies are going to be involved. Okay, so that's exciting. So that would take us to the next phase for some of these scaled experiments, the small scale experiments. And then finally, Rad Fire 2, which is proposed for 2021. Two Dow would be included in this field campaign. The Wyoming King Air, uh, two mobile LIDARs, and our KA Band Mobile. So it will be the largest field campaign to look at plume dynamics ever. And so we're pretty excited about that. And with that, with the Wyoming King Air, we're proposing to put a multi-band, it's a firefinder system with long wave, short wave, and so mid wave, long wave, and short wave, and visible, and it's all georectified. We're gonna put that in the nose cone. So for the first time, we'll be able to look at the fire behavior and see high resolution. I think the resolution would be like five to 10 meters on the ground. Oh man, this is like, and so with that camera and the radar, we will be able to look at heat flux and vertical velocities at the very, for the first time. This is something we don't know. Like how, where's that maximum and plume vertical velocity related to the fire front structure? 
So that's the main, that's an exciting aspect. Here's, here's the Fireflux 2 infrared thermal. So that's what we would get on an active wildfire at very, fairly high resolution. Um, okay, so those are the plans in the future. Uh, I don't really want to go through a lot of this. I just I'll kind of basically say that close range observations can be made at active wildfires. We've been to a number of different fires, mostly in California. We've been requested out of state. Um, come to a, we'll go to a fire near you. We can get requested. Uh, turns out mobile remote sensing observation systems are ideal for studying these plume dynamics. Agile platforms such as smaller four by four trucks that can get in and out of terrain easily. Obviously, we, we would not put our vehicle in fuels. So we try to stay in the black or stay in a very safe location. Um, and, and we follow basically uh, basic firefighter training mandate, basically thinking about escape routes, safety zones, where can we be. And for, fire or for Red Fire 2, we're hiring a safety officer. So an F-band who's retired that will be contracted through our grant that will just be stationed with the team and be our safety liaison officer with the incident command team. So somebody can say, no, you can't go there. Yes, you can go there. Keep our radios all in, in order. So observed high reflectivity cores propagating through the entire depth of plume suggests that the ash and debris are lofted to the top. That's likely what we're seeing in the um, correlation coefficient. We're actually not able to detect those small uh, cloud droplets, but we're actually seeing the ash still. Uh, and we're still, that's preliminary. Uh, and I didn't show you the spectrum width, but high reflectivity associated with the spectrum width likely related to the updraft cores associated with the active fire front. So we could potentially use spectrum width and reflectivity as a marker for the fire front uh, position. And then so just summarizing, small scale experiments are really important because it's really hard to be on an active fire and you can't measure all the micro scale aspects on that fire. You can't get sensors in situ or in, in, in place. So we still have to do these small scale experiments because we can look at things like the local pressure field. We can you know, understand fire spread canyons, fire spreading canyons and like really detail things at that scale with sensors in situ and putting towers set up in, in advance. And then getting back to fire behavior modeling, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an observationalist. I use, uh, I work with a lot of modelers and different uh, groups, but I think that, you know, in the US, the WARF fire model should be adopted as a national community model. WARF is the community weather model, so WARF fire should be the community fire model. And, um, we should require like standard benchmark test cases, the tests that could be uploaded and used for people to run the model, test it on their system. And so it's similar to what's going on here, but uh, I mean, the, the frame, this framework and what, what I saw, was able to see today and colleagues working on this, it's, it's pretty advanced and it's pretty impressive of what's happening with this modeling system. And so I think that it's exciting to see the, how far it's come so far. And then I uh, just want to do a plug. We've got uh, something going on at San Jose State. We're hiring five tenure track faculty in wildfire science. Uh, the um, interviews are happening in the spring, so hopefully everybody will be starting in the fall, including combustion physics and mechanical, fire ecologists, wildfire remote sensing, fire atmosphere modeling, and um, wildfire management and social science. So pretty exciting time in, in here. So. And then the goal with that center of that cluster hire is to develop something like this for the state of California, is to basically take our mobile observation, our monitoring assets, working with uh, tactical aircraft that can maybe do mapping, weather data from uh, air suppression aircraft, so you're getting soundings. And then this technology is all available, we just have to get it on the aircraft. That data can then be streamed to our HPC, our coupled modeling system, and then we can help disseminate that to uh, parties of interest in the community. So this is kind of the, the goal for California. I know Colorado is already, already here doing this, basically. But I'm trying to you know, develop the system for the state. And with the cluster hire, we should have the, the expertise to do that. So with that, I want to thank you all. Thank you, Craig. Uh, this was a great talk. Um, questions for Craig? <laughs> Craig, thank you. That was really, really exciting. And I think for a lot of us who don't look at these data that often, it was really interesting to hear 
quantification of vertical velocities, like you said, 56 meters per second. Do you have a sense of what the surface heat fluxes are in active fire fronts? Or is yeah, in, in, in the experimental fires, the surface heat fluxes are anywhere from 20 kilowatts per meter squared to 400 kilowatts per meter squared. <laughs> So no, we don't, but we've measured it on the grass fires. The grass fires, I, you could use 30 kilowatts per meter squared to 50. Um, on the big fires, I don't know. So we could potentially estimate a vertical velocity from the radar and take that temperature that we measured with the infrared and you know, get it something, but um, I don't have those right now. Thanks. Other questions for Craig? Uh, so maybe I have a question. Um, what can be done uh, to really consolidate the data and for the community so that the whole community can advance the science and, and then response too? Um, well, this kind of carries off from our conversation earlier. Like we don't have really good mapping of the fire fronts. We get one perimeter a day. One thing that I'd like to see, and I propose this for the state of California, is let's get a dedicated aircraft. Let's fly the fires continuously so we have multiple points throughout the fire's evolution. And those data should be uploaded to a database. Another thing that we can do is we can take like the observa you know, we, surface station data. That's trivial. We have it. You know, it's everywhere. California has more weather stations now on the surface than, than we know what to do with, with the IOUs, each putting in 1,000 real-time weather stations. So that's like. 2,500 new weather stations in the last 10 years, I think, and going. So it's just like every, every, tel every power pole has a, has a ROS. Um, maybe taking some test cases. So Fireflux 1 was kind of this unofficial benchmark case that a lot of modelers were using. It is OK, but the Fireflux 2 is much better in some aspects. There's lots of failures in all these field experiments because you know we didn't IR camera didn't work, this and that, but we can get those data sets, put them online, and that can just be a part of the download package. And I think that's been done with uh, the Utah group. They, they had some of those field data that you could just download with it and run the case. Um, so that would be one thing. I think as, as the Warfire model gets more developed and people are really adopting it, then we could have a data repository for cases. But then, like, okay, I like this fire, but that fire doesn't mean anything to anybody else, so is it worth it? How do you justify what fire you should be simulating or what fire we should be looking at? Has to have per good perimeter data, good ignition data, good fuels data, good weather data. So, and that's where we're at. We're, we're still missing all that. And the modeling community, I'm, you know, I don't need to tell you that, but yeah, so we still need to, you know, the observations on wildfires, I think, are still, we're just, we're just getting into it. Hopefully that answered your question. Yes, thank you. I was just wondering for the campfire or hmm. other fires like that, are you able to get in a place where you can observe the spread of fire from a wildfire into an urban area and see how the spread in the plume is changing? We, you can. It's not easy, and again, that's, that's the issue. It's like, do we want to be in a place where we can, you know, watching home uh, active suppression on housing, on homes, is, is not really something I like, I'm comfortable with. I'm not a firefighter. And so we, we can get there. I think we need to have re a research team do that. Because uh, obviously it's not up to first responders to collect data. They need to do their job. But if we could have, you know, we're fireline qualified, we're tied in with a lot of incidents, we can actually do that. There's one way to do it. You could do it from ground with infrared and cameras and kind of like monitor what's happening, but you don't want to be walking around. You want to be at least 500 meters to a kilometer away. I mean, you can't really be in the core of it. Um, another thing is aircraft, satellite, but the, sat you know, the, the resolution's not going to get the spots. So getting those spot fires and ignitions is really is hard to do. So you might have to do that from ground observations with either video cameras or IR cameras. Eventually, drone operations will be integrated into uh, 
the suppression activities. I would imagine we're getting closer and closer to that. So that could be one way if you can integrate you know, these new drone technologies for mapping during an event, then, then we can collect some of those data or have air, a dedicated aircraft above. Any other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, let's thank. Uh, Thanks for coming time. to my talk.